History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 335th episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Kelly. On this episode, Kelly, we are featuring a location that was suggested by our listener, Whitney Zahar, who will also be joining us shortly. We've had Whitney join us, I don't know, four or five times now. And she always is a real help with research. Definitely. She's fantastic. And the really cool thing is she took part in a paranormal investigation of this location. And she's going to share some of her experiences, too. I know. How cool is that? That's St. Albans Sanatorium. So we're going to another one of these big asylum type places. But before we get into that, we want to welcome into the Spooktacular crew, Rose. I think this is Air, A-E-R, Rachel, who spells her name at the end, E-A-L, Lisa, Steve, who's known as Spooky Steve, and he hosts tours in Savannah, Alistair, Hope, Kathy with a C, Greg with two G's at the end, and then I'm not sure how to say this one either. It's R-A-H. Is that Ray or Ra? I'm not sure. I think it's probably Ray. Kathy with a K, Robin, and then we have two Kellys, Kelly. Excellent. Kelly R and Kelly L. And I'm a Kelly R. You are. (laughs) I originally was a Kelly R, Kelly Roberts. Thanks for joining, everybody. And now, this moment, Noddity. The moment in Oddity was suggested by Mike Stribal. We've all had that nightmare where you're falling through the sky, but imagine if it was not a nightmare. This is what happened to Aran Asab Pruitt in 1956. He and his wife, Blanding Smith, were newlyweds who had met while working at a hotel together in North Carolina. They arrived at the Charlotte airport on June 13, 1956, with plans to leave on their honeymoon, but they had not prepared properly and they arrived late. They could not board their flight, but were given another one leaving at 5.54 p.m. for Asheville. They got the last two seats aboard a Piedmont N45V, a DC-3, known as a Tidewater Pacemaker. The airplane was piloted by Captain Baxter Slaughter and experienced a tragedy in the skies over Shelby, North Carolina, as it cruised at 6,500 feet. Blending was not feeling well, and so Iran got up to get her some water. He found the lavatory door at the rear of the plane locked, so he tried the other door back there, which happened to be a cabin door. The purser felt the change in pressure and went to the cockpit to get the co-pilot to help him with closing the door. They found a terrified woman trapped in the lavatory because she needed to walk past the open door to return to her seat. The two men locked arms to form a chain and pulled the woman to safety, but they couldn't close the door. The plane continued on to Asheville. When it landed and people started investigating, they found heel marks on the side of the plane indicating that Mr. Pruitt had hung on for a while. Witnesses in the area where he eventually landed reported hearing his screaming. He was more than likely alive for most of the fall. The place where Pruitt's fall ended was, ironically, Zion Baptist Church Cemetery in Cleveland County. To memorialize the fall, a small monument was placed in the spot where Pruitt landed. He was buried at another cemetery. He was the first Piedmont passenger to die in their eight years of prior service. No one knows why Pruitt opened that door. Was it an accident? Was he drunk? Or had a fight he was having with his wife caused him to act in a drastic way? Whatever the case may be, a man falling out of a plane and landing in a cemetery certainly is odd. And now, this month in history.
In the month of May, on the 6th in 1840, the Penny Black was issued. The Penny Black was the world's first adhesive postage stamp to be used by a public postal system. The name came from the fact that the background of the stamp was black and it cost a penny, thus the Penny Black. The face of the stamp featured a profile of Queen Victoria, which was engraved by Charles Heath and his son Frederick. They based their design on a sketch done by Henry Corbold, inspired by an 1834 cameo-like head made of Queen Victoria by William Wyon. The stamp was embellished in the corners with Maltese crosses with solar discs radiating out in the center. The penny black made it possible to mail things at a flat rate rather than the usual, where the recipient paid upon delivery. The stamp was only used for a year because it was hard to see the red cancellation stamp over the black, and people were able to reuse the stamps. In February 1841, the penny black became the penny red, and black ink was used to cancel them, which was harder to remove, and thus the stamps weren't reused. St. Albans Sanatorium in Virginia started out as a Lutheran boys' school before becoming a psychiatric infirmary. As was the case with so many hospitals for the mentally ill, this one started with promising expectations that unraveled into crowded conditions and abusive treatments. There were deaths and suicides. There is so much paranormal activity at this location that many refer to this as one of the most haunted places on the East Coast. Join us and listener Whitney Zahar as we delve into the history and haunts for the St. Albans Sanatorium. As we said, Whitney is going to join us to talk about the history of the sanatorium and also her experiences there. So here we go. This is the kind of location where every time you go, something is always different. This place is a real enigma. I was actually there when uh, Tennessee Wraith Chasers went up there. Okay. Uh, Chris and Mike. Chris and Mike were there. They were very nice. Mike even gave me a nickname. What did he call you? He calls me Gutter Girl. (laughs) Gutter Girl. What did you do to earn that name? So we were in the bowling alley, which is one of the hot spots. And I was sitting at the back and we were trying to, you know, elicit activity by talking to the spirits. And I just said, hey, you got to be a better bowler than me. I bowl nothing but gutter balls, which is kind of true. I'm not the best bowler in the world. And so Mike started calling me gutter girl. Well, at least it's for a bowling alley gutter and not like the street gutter. Right. And well, and also the fact that my mind is permanently in the gutter. (laughs) (laughs) Especially now. (laughs) Well, that's great then. They were both very nice people. You know, I I have some of my, I've got some pet peeves with celebrity investigators. Sometimes I think it just sort of disrupts the flow. Mm-hmm. And also it just attracts large crowds, which it's a good thing for the site, be, especially if they're trying to preserve it. And that's the only way you could do it. But at the same time, it's also, well, you know, celebrity investigators, you're kind of like, oh, they're celebrities. They're doing their thing. Oh. <laughs> and it does kind of bring in large, larger groups. Yeah. And some sites, I think, are much better to examine when it comes to the smaller groups. But who knows? I mean, I'm going to go back there, hopefully with some smaller groups. That's the plan. Their history tours apparently can last a good couple of hours, kind of on the same realm as the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum tours. I honestly think I would have more fun doing that and then going into an investigation because then I'll feel I have more of the grounding of history and what we believe is fact. 
Sure. It gives you a little bit more of a basis to ask the right questions, try to figure out who you're communicating with. Yeah. And that's one of the big enigmas, I think, of St. Albans, at least from my own experience. I really don't know who exactly or what exactly I'm communicating with. A lot of groups have been there and they have their own ideas and there are some stories going around, but I've recently done some research and I think I might be debunking some of the historical stories. Hey, that's good. (laughs) It's all good. Yes. It's an interesting, I I do like to call it a, a laboratory. It is a very interesting place to do paranormal investigations and storytelling and visiting this place because I think the more you do so, the more you get through the layers and ultimately to the truth of what's really going on there. So the sanatorium is located in Radford, Virginia, and it's had a lot of history right on that spot there. Do you want to share some of that with us? Technically, it's located just a little outside of Radford. In this whole area, they call that basically a big metropolitan area. It includes Radford, of course. It includes Christiansburg, Virginia. And it includes Blacksburg, Virginia, which is the home of Virginia Tech. Okay, cool. Yeah. And that whole area, that whole metropolitan area has been sort of a good prime location because of rivers, especially the New River. And the New River just runs right outside the bluff where you see the sanatorium perched. It's like right there. It's a big watershed. It's a place. It's also big for the railroad. The Virginia, Tennessee Railroad ran their line through there once upon a time. Radford actually started out life as a train town. Uh, It was basically a a depot. And in fact, that's what they called it. They called it based on where the depots were. At first, it was Lovely Mount Depot, and then it became known as Central Depot. Radford then became home to a college in 1913, and that was a state normal school for women. Later on, it became Radford College in 1924, and then became Radford University in 1979. The name for the town was changed to Radford in 1891. And who was, was it named after something or? Yeah, it was named for a gentleman by the name of Dr. John B. Radford. There actually is a home and it's on the register of historic places. And if this is the same Radford I'm thinking about, I believe it was his daughter, Anne, who married a gentleman named Gabriel Wharton, who is a big person involved in the Confederate Army. And their house is called Glencoe. And it's a beautiful house right there in Radford. And it's used as a history museum today. I spent a lot of time there before I went on the investigation because I'm a nerd and I wanted to get a good lay of the land. And it's a beautiful museum. And they have some very interesting artifacts there. Glencoe House was continuously occupied by members of that family until the 1990s. Wow. Yeah. So it's got a long history of family living there and it's perched right there on the on a bluff. There's a lot of hilly country in there because you're at the base of the Blue Ridge Mountains. It's very hilly. So you can see a lot of things all around you. It's a beautiful little area. But so I definitely would recommend it. To get to the ridge, the actual land where St. Albans was built on, there's been a story circulating that once upon a time, it was the site of a massacre. However, I have done some research and I have realized that it's not exactly in that location. In the 1700s, there was a place called Draper's Meadow. And you may have heard of it. I, I don't know. but um, I have. And I think I've heard the same story that you're going to tell everybody. And when I looked at it, too, I'm like, how could this have anything to do with hauntings at St. Albans? It's a little ways away. It is. So Draper's Meadow, which was the settlement, is actually on the site of where Virginia Tech is located. And in fact, there are historical markers and all sorts of things there. However, I think what makes people sort of make those connections is because the woman who actually escaped from 
after being captured by the Shawnee and taken all the way to Kentucky. Her name was Mary Draper Ingalls or Inglis. She ended up trekking all the way back. And she part of her trail may have gone through what we know today as Radford. She did eventually, with her husband, develop a farm and a tavern called Ingalls Ferry, which is located close to Radford in Pulaski County. Mm -hmm. So she does have a connection there. But for the massacre to happen on that land, not likely. Gotcha. That's what that was kind of my feeling. Yeah. And I know that's been one of the big stories. I mean, this isn't to say that the land isn't charged. And definitely that whole area was the site for various Native American settlements across the river from the sanatorium on the Radford side. There's a place called Bissett Park, and it's one of the four big parks that's in that area. There was a Native American site there at one point. I cannot remember the exact tribe who is there or who the name of that site now it's complete I'm completely drawing a blank but they did do some excavations there not too long ago there definitely were Native American settlements all up and down this area drawn drawn to the river of course yeah exactly I mean this is the new river it's the Shenandoah Valley so it's a beautiful area to be in so you can see why there would be some skirmishes if they're trying to put settlements in here and the Native Americans are already there Absolutely. And more than just settlements from the white settlers versus the Native Americans, but also Native American versus Native American. That's one thing people need to always remember. Native Americans are people just like anybody else. They're going to (laughs) fight and get territory from each other, too. That is very true. That's one of the things that I kind of wanted to clarify, because so many people tell that story about... Mary Draper Ingalls, and if it was Draper's Meadow on that site where St. Albans now is, and it's not. But it is close. It is close. Now, is there any truth to there being some, I think the Battle of Cloyd's Mountain is said to have taken place here. Was there any kind of skirmish during the Civil War on the site? So the Battle of Cloyd's Mountain, and I've actually been doing some looking on that, it did take place in Pulaski County, which is in the same county as Saint, as the future St. Albans. Technically, uh, the fighting took place in a little town called Dublin in Pulaski County, and it was it took place on a farm called Bat Creek Farm. I love that name. I do, too. And Bat Creek Farm is also on the National Register of Historic Places, which is pretty cool. But it was also served as a hospital um, and as headquarters for the Union General of that battle, who was uh, George Crook. And actually, under his command were future presidents, Captain Rutherford B. Hayes and William McKinley. Now, is that where St. Albans is? Probably not, but it is in the same county. And that's not to say that there was passing through that area. Again, the river was a very attractive prospect. Plus, this battle, the Battle of Cloyd's Mountain, enabled the Union to destroy the last vestiges of the Virginia-Tennessee Railroad, which was running through that area. So it definitely would have affected Radford for sure. Absolutely. And that battle was fought on May 9th, 1864. And now a little break for a word about one of our sponsors. Hey, Kelly, I'm over here. What are you doing hiding in the box elders? I'm spying on Mort. He's been acting so weird ever since he started his free 30-day trial with Kobo Audiobooks. He got his first audiobook free and was off and running. Well, I've enabled him by keeping a subscription and paying the $9.99 a month. I mean, you can't beat that price when it comes to audiobooks. And the selection is great with a huge catalog of audiobooks, including bestsellers and originals. There really is something for everyone. And don't forget, for those who don't want a monthly subscription, they can use code HISTORY40 to get 40% off of Kobo's select audiobooks. Look, quick. This must be why Mort was listening to Dating, the ultimate guide to find the girl you've been looking for your whole life by Tim J. Sparks. Mort has a girlfriend? He just handed her a lily, so I think so. I brought you these lilies, Morticia. How thoughtful, Mort. Wanna go dig a grave with me? Oh, Mort, you're so romantical. 
To get started with Kobo audiobooks, visit kobo.com forward slash history goes bump. That's K-O-B-O dot com forward slash history goes bump. And start listening to Kobo audiobooks today. Well, a few years away from that, we have St. Albans Sanatorium, but it wasn't a sanatorium when it was first built. Was it called St. Albans when it was first built? Yeah, it was actually a Lutheran school for boys, and it was built in 1892. So that that much is definitely true. Okay. It was established as basically as the town of Radford grew. Because it did grow steadily and surely, there were people that were attracted to the area. And also the headmaster and the founder of that school, a man named George Miles, he wanted to produce a new breed of Southern gentlemen because you are looking at basically Reconstruction period towards the tail end of it, but still it's going on. In fact, I have a feeling Reconstruction never really left Virginia, if you know what I mean. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> gotcha. But that school, he basically, it was a Lutheran school. And I was doing a little bit of looking into who St. Alban actually was. I'm not really up on my Catholic saints or anything. But St. Alban, he was some kind of martyr. And I think he lost his head. Well, I've heard some things about the school that there was a lot of hazing that went on there and stuff. Unfortunately, I haven't really been able to gain a whole lot of grounding in the records on that, but they did thrive on athletics and they were certainly known to be a very competitive, very athletic school. I don't know how much academics was put into the situation. There was an interesting quote about a student And I'm going to get some of these quotes from a book that I will share with you guys. It is called The Ghosts of St. Albans Sanatorium. And it's a combination of all the different investigations and stories that have gone through St. Albans, as well as beautiful photography of the building. So I'm getting this straight from that particular source. Basically, with uh, St. Albans, one of the students was quoted in saying in 1904, a young man named E. Blackburn Runyon, who apparently was maybe a freshman, somebody was quoted by the yearbook editor in 1904, E. Blackburn Runyon did not return after Christmas, much to our sorrow, as it put a stop to the football games on the terrace in which he figured prominently as the football. Unquote. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Poor kid. Yeah. It definitely seemed to favor from from what it's from what some people are saying, it did seem to favor some of the stronger boys. Why I don't know. I don't know if the bullying there was standard. Of course we all know bullying should never be standard, but we're also talking early nineteen hundreds where we didn't have the kind of policies we have today. Exactly. Now, apparently, you can get access to some of the yearbooks. It was called The Promise, P-R-O-M-U-S, and it was written by the students every year, and it would feature the athletic teams that detail their descriptions of wins or losses. But there's also a couple of poems that showed up in some of these yearbooks, and I actually would like to read one to you if, you would le- if you're okay with that. Yeah, sounds great. Okay, so this one is called The Albans Ghosts, and it's dedicated to JCB. I don't know who that is, but this is a poem that showed up in the 1893 to 1894 issue of The Promise. Here we go. The master sat in his easy chair. The study hall lamps burnt bright, but little he knew that a horrid crew were marshalling just out of sight. Harry opened the door When across the floor, with the stride both bold and grim, come Peters the Great, straight on to the fate the master had waiting for him. When Charlie walked in, a mighty din shook the windows again and again, while Harry and Frank enjoyed the prank and followed with smirks and a grin. These four came on with chatter and groan to quote-unquote queer, the master and boys. In burnt cork and sheets, they walked the streets and made a ghost-like noise. The scheme went awry. 
They were caught on the fly. In the study hall, they sat quite a while. Thirty days on the lot helped to spoil the plot of demerits. They rolled up a pile. <laughs> Next day at their posts, these merry ghosts fell akin to Hamlet's sire. For purging away the crimes of that day, they thought they fasted in fire. <laughs> Naughty boys. You know, these boys were also interacting with the city of Radford. They were, you know, with dances and functions at the school. So it sounds like it was like, I wouldn't say it was a typical boarding school, but it definitely sounds like from that poem that these were fairly typical high school boys. While I haven't heard much of records of suicides or deaths associated with the boys' school, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe some of the echoes we hear there might have come from the boys' school. It does make you wonder because we know even in our more modern era, sometimes some of these hazing incidents end up with people accidentally dying and such. So it is a possibility. But it's it's fascinating. I want to actually delve more. We focus so much on the sanatorium aspect of St. Albans, but it has this history before it. And I think it would be really interesting to delve more into that. Who knows? That might even explain some of the hauntings. I agree. But anyway, um, St. Albans was pretty much on a roll. I mean, there's it was on a roll for a while. And then in 1904, I believe it was, there was an article in the Richmond Times Dispatch that says it's going to close. It's going to close in September 1904 due to a change in management and lack of students. Professor Miles, the headmaster, had retired from the school. We don't know exactly why. Some say that he may have been dealing with health issues. And actually, he did die in 1905 of liver cancer. But he was a driving force in keeping that school going. He remained affiliated with it, even though he really wasn't working there. Somebody else was the headmaster. But yeah, it was set to close down. And then it just closed down as after 1905. And it remained closed and the buildings deserted for at least a few for a few years. And then we enter the other stage. That's when it became St. Albans Sanatorium. It opened as St. Albans Sanatorium in 1916. And it was under the jurisdiction of a man named Dr. J.C. King, who was once superintendent of another uh, mental hospital in Virginia. And what he wanted to do was actually show more dignity to the patients. He wanted to give them better treatment than some of the other sanatoriums in the past. And this is such a, you know what, it is such a fascinating time period, the 19th into the early 20th century, where people are trying to learn what exactly constitutes mental illness. Mm -hmm. And what should be done in how to treat them? You can't just give them a pill and say, hey, you're good. Does it require more or do you need to cut them open? You, I mean, people are, there were so many treatments that we would view today as controversial. And many of them were, don't, don't misunderstand me. Many of these treatments were absolutely barbaric. But were they barbaric because people didn't know any better? Or were they barbaric because people were just trying new things? Who knows? We were taught, I know you, this is the perfect time to talk about this because you were talking about lobotomies and all those treatments going on trans-Allegheny mm -hmm. last time. Wow. I love the connections here. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not too far away from each other, West Virginia to Virginia. No, they're not. And in fact, they're, they weren't very far apart at all. And I've been actually making a lot of connections with the treatment of mental illness because one of my writing projects I've been working on has been about eugenics. Oh, And wow. this is in that time period. Now, I actually did talk to Marcel, who's the director of operations at St. Albans, and she's a lovely lady. I did spend a lot of time during the investigation talking with Marcel and with the guides and the people that actually work there. And I asked them, has there been any evidence of sterilization, all those things that they were talking about with the eugenics movement? And the sad thing about St. Albans 
is a lot of their records are missing or destroyed. And I do know that there was a flood of the New River in 1940. Now, whether that did something to some of the records, I don't know. You know that people would store their records in the basement for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Don't put your records in the basement, folks. Bad idea. (laughs) They flood all the time. Mm -hmm. Even when they're high up like that. Patients were always treated bad in these situations, I think. But I really think from what I gathered from some of the people I spoke to at St. Albans, I think Dr. King was actually trying not to go in those directions. But eventually crowding came in, overcrowding. You have a lack of properly trained medical staff and huge patient to doctor ratios. And again, you're going to get more recipes for disaster. So it's, it it's such a sad story. Even though conditions where people were actually sleeping, the conditions were actually better than most hospitals, but the treatment was still going on. You still had hydrotherapy treatment. You definitely had electroshock therapy. And then you had something called insulin shock therapy or insulin coma therapy. That one always blows my brain. I don't know if they thought that the brain was like out of alignment or something. And if you just shocked it in such a way that it would correct whatever the issue was, that they would do all these things that were, you know, electroshock, cold shock, insulin shock, like you said. Yeah, I mean, I think at some point, some people actually believed that seizures were therapeutic. Yeah, it was almost like rock the brain around a little bit. I guess it's the same reasoning behind a lobotomy. You just, you know, put a little needle in there and move it around a little bit and stir it and it'll get them right. Yeah, I mean, it's just, oh, God. I mean, it's, we look at it today and we're like, what were you all thinking? But maybe at that time for some of these doctors and society at large, they really didn't know what they were thinking. With the insulin shock therapy, I actually was doing a little looking into how it started. There was a a guy named Manfred Sackle, and he introduced the idea of insulin shock therapy in 1927. He was a doctor from Vienna, and he had the idea that, oh, one patient I saw actually experienced mental clarity after slipping into an accidental coma after being given a low dose of insulin. And this supposedly was a drug addict or a psychopath. Because of this level of improvement, he reasoned, oh, this should work on mentally ill patients. I mean, (laughs) it worked once. So, hey, why not just try it on a few people and see what happens? It's dreadful. And even now, we're still not exactly sure. We have so much more knowledge now, but we still don't really know how the brain truly works, especially with a disease like schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And so many of the medications, even the ones that, you know, are, are much better nowadays, now they're finding out that some of the side effects of it, it cause you to have shaking constantly and other things that it makes you understand why people decide that they don't want to take their medication anymore. Because it's like, well, the side effects, do I want that? Or do I want to have my brain functioning correctly for me? And yeah, but also, I mean, again, like most other sanatoriums at the time, St. Albans was fairly self-sufficient. Whole idea of isolation and getting people out in the fresh air and doing tasks It sounds like Dr. J.C. King was just like anybody else who was trying to figure his way out in treatment, but it didn't always stay that way. St. Albans also became a working hospital, a full hospital, I believe in the 60s. I think it it served the city of Radford, and it closed down in the 90s, I believe. So it had a really long run over 100 years. It had years a long, now. long run, very long run. And now it's still kind of, I'm still trying to follow the train between who oh, who initially purchased the building and who owns it. Um, at one point, Radford University, I think, was going to do something with it. But And in fact, if you look at pictures today, there is a modern day building right beside the sanatorium. But I was never able to really figure out what 
that was used for. I do know that somebody who did purchase the building initially was once a patient at St. Albans. And what he wanted to do was save the building and tell the story of what went on there and preserve it. And now it's a skeleton crew of people there. It's one person pretty much in charge of it, along with some docents and volunteers. It's it's an interesting little place to be in. It's definitely one of the grittiest locations I've been in. Yeah, I agree with you. Trying to trace its most recent ownership is hard. I, I did see that Radford University had bought it in like 2004, and then supposedly the oldest building they have there was going to be demolished, and it was saved by what they deemed were concerned citizens. But then you see that That owner that you were talking about that was a former patient, I did see a newspaper article where he was hosting, I think a couple of the ghost hunters were going to be there. And that Mm -hmm. was in 2010. And that was like the last thing that I could find on who owned the property. And I was looking all over their website going, well, who owns it today? I'm I'm sure it's not the same guy because it's he had called it like the Research and Enlightenment Center, but it's not that anymore, obviously. Right. I can't speak to it. And I didn't even ask. I don't know how much of my business I'm trying to draw when I'm trying to research things. I try to draw the line between being a curious and avid historical researcher who's interested in the paranormal versus an all out nosy neighbor. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, at this point, it really doesn't matter. We know that it's open like a museum for tours and overnight investigations. And they're clearly trying to keep the building together. But like you said, some of the pictures I've seen of it, it is in pretty rough condition, it looks like. It breaks my heart when I see that. And it really makes me wonder, sometimes I think that hauntings can also be caused when people just go into the building and just mess around, whether it's spraying graffiti and ever. I mean, no matter what it used to be, and I don't care how many daring teenagers wanted to sneak in and do stuff, you don't mess with a historical building like that. You don't chip things away. You don't spray paint. It's heartbreaking. It really is awful. Well, I remembered you sharing some of your pictures in the Spooktacular crew. And I was like, oh my gosh, look at the graffiti in this place. Uh Uh-huh. Especially down in the bowling alley. That place is... I mean, I understand why some people get very spooked out in a building that's full of graffiti. You And you don't know when it was put in. Yeah. That's the other... Yeah. That's the other side of it. You don't know when it all actually started. There's so many layers of stuff there. It's unbelievable. Well, uh, clearly, we have some paranormal activity going on in this building. Uh Uh-huh. Where do you want to start talking about that? Do you want to talk about anything that you experienced first, or do you want to talk about what other people have shared? So once again, I'm going to refer to this book. You can get it on Amazon. It's called The Ghosts of St. Albans Sanatorium. And it was written by, I'm actually going to pull up the author for you. There she is. Uh, The author is Pat Boussard O'Keefe. She's a photographer and she's also a paranormal investigator. So one of the highlights of this book is just the way she captured all of the features of the building, you know, from full shots to close up details, you can see how what a place it must have been. And, you know, she does have the chapters are laid out by talking about the different paranormal investigative groups in recent years who have come to the St. Albans to have some of the experiences. So there is actually a list of who is haunting the building or who people believe are haunting the building. Let's clarify that. (laughs) (laughs) They're guesstimates. Okay, so let's start at the bottom. Let's start at the bowling alley. That actually was one of my interesting experiences personally. Now, what some people say is... The bowling alley, they apparently get the idea of a childlike spirit down there, and they call her Allie, Allie Mm -hmm. of the bowling alley. They say that they've heard her laugh. There's even some St. Albans staff members that have said they've seen a police officer had his flashlight lifted out of his pocket, which apparently freaked him out. (laughs) But we don't know who this is. I don't know where people have gotten the names of some of these entities, if, they, if they're even the right names at all. So let me just put that out there. But there's also something kind of malevolent down there, apparently. And they call it Red Eyes. Ooh, 
Well, yeah, I think we know what it must look like. <laughs> yep. A big black mass with red eyes. Yikes. Yeah. My experience down there was very interesting. <laughs> That was where uh, Mike of Tennessee Wraith Chases called me Gutter Girl. It was amusing. And apparently, uh, according to uh, the mail meter or whatever device that they have, I'm not up on my paranormal devices. Please excuse me. I'm not the device queen. But it did react when they were like, do you want us to call Whitney Gutter Girl? It stayed silent. Do you want us to stop calling her that? Beep! Oh, it was defending you. See, Whitney? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think somebody likes me there I anyway, so. <laughs> but I was sitting at the end of the bowling alley. I was, I decided to go and sit in this folding chair and they have pins and balls all over the place to kind of trigger the spirits to knock down things. And I'm sure the spirits are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but as I was sitting there, I had the feeling of something coming up behind me and just tapping my ears. Like in Mork and Mindy at the very end, he goes, Nanu, Nanu. Mm-hmm. That's the feeling I had. And I could feel it too. It was a vi- it was subtle. And I had my hair tied back that night. And I, for the record too, this was also in February. So I was wearing like three layers of clothing, plus a heavy jacket and a backpack. So I was all layered up there. It was pretty crazy. And then later on, Still in that same area, I got the feeling of something on the side of my neck, like just hovering over the side of my neck and just sort of touching. And at the very moment that happened, there was a periscope set up behind me, like all the way off on the frame where the bowling pin machine is. It was sitting right back there and I was like a good four feet away from it and it reacted. Wow. Yeah. And Apparently, Mike from Tennessee Wraith Chasers was kind of like, whoa, I wasn't expecting that. (laughs) That was interesting. I'm not exactly sure what's in the bowling alley. To me, it felt playful the way that it was like tapping at my ears like, nanu, nanu. Yeah, I mean, if it's this big, black, threatening shadow figure with red eyes, I wouldn't think it would just be tickling your ears, kind of. Right. Although... This is a common thing, and I've talked to some of my friends who have been to St. Albans more than one time, and they've told me, you never know what you're going to get when you go there. It's always different. Some nights, some spirits don't want to talk to you, but other spirits do, or you'll have more of a malevolent experience, or it'll be more positive. I mean, it's a mixed bag there. Another one of my experiences was in electroshock. Good news, they do not have any electroshock stuff there, thank God. Let me also tell you guys, in order for them to make money, they do operate an actual haunted house attraction at St. Albans. And a couple of weeks prior to my investigation, they had run their Valentine-themed haunted house. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, yeah, you know, my bloody Valentine, stuff like that. Sure, why not? Valentine's Day is scary. (laughs) We can make every holiday scary around here. So works for me. Exactly. There were still some things from that, but they had done their best to make it as clear as possible. So that way we had the full run of the sanatorium for the investigation. So in the electroshock room, it's an empty room, but they do have a stretcher bed in there. Uh, And that's probably a remnant from the haunted attraction. That area is like three different rooms. They have a waiting area for electroshock, and apparently there's a cord that they would tie some of the patients up to, so that way they wouldn't wander off, or so that way they wouldn't be so aggressive. I got the feeling of constant coming and going through that area, because it's like, okay, you're waiting here, bring them in, put them in recovery, because the recovery room is in the back of the whole electroshock complex. And I had the sensation of my forehead actually burning. Whoa, that's weird. Yeah, it was very weird. And I was standing on the threshold of the electroshock room and my forehead just started burning. And then I also got the feeling of my tongue swelling up. Whoa. Yes, (laughs) yes. And needless to say, that did kind of freak me out a bit. So I backed off. I didn't get the feeling of an intelligent haunt. If there was one, I feel like it's very residual. Again, people just sort of back and forth, coming and going, Mm -hmm. wheeling people in, wheeling people out. 
putting people into the recovery room. And we did go back into the recovery room and there was an interesting uh, REM pod session that we had there. And I got the feeling that they were all just sort of surrounding the lights and making them go around in a circle and then just flat out drowsiness and sleepiness. And I, I guess if your brain had been shocked like that, you probably would want to be knocked out afterwards. Sure. It would be pretty overwhelming to you. Yeah. And I was like, I'm tired. (laughs) I just want to sleep now. Makes you wonder if maybe they sedated them too, just because it's a pretty intense procedure. I would not be surprised. And in fact, uh, one thing that I did, I wanted to learn a little more about insulin coma therapy. And sometimes those two treatments went hand in hand, electroshock and insulin coma. They did have hydrotherapy rooms. They used, I think they used to have bathtubs in there, but when I went in there, the bathtubs were all gone. But you could see the tile flooring and everything. And there's equipment everywhere. There, and I don't know how much of it was used as set pieces for the haunt, for the haunted house attraction, or if it was leftovers from its previous life, but crazy in there. Now, my best experience, though, was in an isolation ward. Yay! (laughs) So we went up to, and I actually took some notes on, what I do when I investigate is I always have a notebook. I just have to write things down. And I went up to, we were up on this level, which was used as isolation wards. And who knows who, how many people came and went through those. I I couldn't tell you. There was this one room, it was on my right-hand side, I believe it was room 14. And this was on something that they called the pink floor because, well, at the very end, it was pink. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. As I was passing room 14, it was like a wave. It was like a wave of anger just coming up and going right into my face. Like, hey, you, just like that. Like, whom? And I'm like, whoa. And I felt it too. Like all of a sudden I got this surge of anger. For no real reason. I have no reason to be angry at anybody. And I was like, ooh, ooh. And I'm jabbing my finger towards that room. And I'm like, there. I want to go in there. I'm going in there. So the rest of the group that I was in went down to an isolation ward below us. And I had one of the docents uh, who went with the group. And one of the other investigators came in with me. So there were three of us in this little room. He set up a REM pod, and we had pretty much plastered ourselves against the wall <laughs> to <laughs> so nothing stay out of the range. Yeah. I got this feel. Like I said, I was wearing three layers of clothes. I had long johns. I had a thick sweater on and a really thick winter jacket. I was bundled up perfectly. You would have been proud of me, Diane. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I would have been, too, for sure. Yeah, and boots. I was wearing boots. And even through all those layers, it felt like something was poking me in the back. Wow. Like, poke, poke, poke. I mean, nothing And, and you're hard. against the wall. Is that what you'd said? Huh? Are you against the wall all the way, or? I had my backpack on me. That is so weird. Yeah. I thought it was pretty weird, too. And so I kind of shifted my position a little bit. I didn't get the feeling of maliciousness, even with the anger. I didn't get the feeling of malice, just anger and adrenaline. So I moved a little bit, and we were just sort of plastered on both all these sides of the wall. And the REM pod started going absolutely berserk. I mean, it was flashing colors everywhere. And it got to the point where we couldn't make it stop. It was almost this feeling that if there was energy in there, it was all swarming around the REM pod. We had to turn it off and leave the room for a little bit. And then when we came back in and turned it back on again, it didn't react like that for the rest of the night. So it almost seems like whatever was in there with you left. Yeah, it did. In fact, I did get the feeling that it felt empty afterwards. I know that feeling. Pretty much, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, isolation wards, people just come and go through there. You don't know. It was quite an interesting night. (laughs) Sounds like it. And it made, I felt, but at the same time, despite it all, I felt safe. You know what I mean? It it was a weird feeling. You weren't scared at all. No. And I thought I would be. I Uh was expecting to, but I just felt this sense of, I felt humbled because 
so much happened there in the treatment of the mentally ill. And that's a passion project of mine to learn more about the history of mental treatment and also how society views the Mm -hmm. mentally ill. So I felt humbled that I had this opportunity to come to this building that I've been hearing so much about. And I feel like it showed me one side of the pu- of its puzzle, but I felt safe. I, I mean, that's a very strange way to say it, but that's how I that's how I put it. I felt I felt safe there. That's good because what it seems to me is that it's indicating that most of the spirits that are there are not malevolent in some way. <sighs> Yeah, I mean, and I've only been there once, but, you know, there's so many other entities walking around. There apparently is a creeper there, Diane. Oh, gosh, no, please. Oh, yes. (laughs) Oh, yes. Now, did I experience this creeper? No. I'm not even sure exactly who or what I experienced there. I don't know how much of it was mental patients, how much of it was boys from the school, or how much of it could be just the environment. Sure. I mean, the anger isn't necessarily a person. It might have just been the emotion manifesting. Yeah, it might have been. But it's a fascinating place. And what I want to do is actually find a way to get to the bottom of some of these stories. I mean, one notorious story is of a woman called Rebecca. I don't know who Rebecca is. Rebecca is reputed to be a patient, a woman in her 20s or 30s. And apparently she hanged herself in a room on the third floor of the sanatorium called the suicide bathroom Mm. because apparently there's been four documented suicides in that particular bathroom. Wow. Yeah. I know that one of my group was trying to contact Rebecca. You know, I don't know. I don't know. There's also another story of a little boy named Jacob who apparently was murdered by an orderly named Donald in the 1970s. He basically is on the second floor landing in a room down there. And then in another room is Donald's room. Jacob's room has toys and stuff. It it seems like these sanatoriums have all these stories about children. It's just like when you mentioned Allie, I was like, well, why is there a child down in the bowling alley area? I have no idea. I, I don't even know how much of a history there is of children actually being at the sanatorium. I think that's something that the actual staff of St. Albans are trying to figure out. Yeah, because I, you know, we hear it all the time. Every time there's a sanatorium or an asylum, there's always children's spirits there, too. And you're like, well, I mean, I know back in jail times and stuff, too, they put the kids in with everybody. So it's a possibility that they had children in there. But mm-hmm. and, and especially because she's Allie, she's a girl. So she wouldn't have been there with these when it was a boys school. So unless they had girls who sometimes came there for events or something, maybe. Well, funny you should mention that back to the history of the boys school. The students were actually invited to have meals with the headmaster and his family. And they were, they were treated as part of the family. And, you know, during the days of the school, I'm sure they had mixers and dances and other functions, especially with the, uh, but this was before the Radford College was set up. So who knows? But I'm, I know for a fact there were school, other schools there. It's interesting. And, but then a lot of the other haunting activity seems to be kind of shadow people and I think a lot of residual energy. I heard a couple of growls on some of my equipment, but I don't think it was malicious. I think it was atmospheric. Who knows? There's so many mysteries there. So many. Yeah, sometimes you wonder if the growling too has possibly been in a an insulin coma, maybe that's how you're communicating after that, or maybe it's any yeah. kind of these procedures. It, it's just a way that you're communicating or a almost like a groan kind of thing. I mean, if you put me into an ice bath, I'm going to be making some noises. I wouldn't be surprised. I, I really wouldn't. The other thing to keep in mind about St. Albans, too, is it is exposed in many ways to the elements. There are bugs in the building. I'm sure there have been animal sightings in the building. <laughs> Sure. I mean, it's not as out in the wilderness as it used to be. Uh, One of the funniest things for me when I was driving up the uh, hill to St. Albans is it's like, oh, at the base of the hill, I see a McDonald's. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) Kind of pulls you right out of where you were at. 
Yeah, it did actually. It was like, you know, I really could go for a hamburger right now. <laughs> You're like, I'm communicating with spirits and oh, that scent of French fries. All of a sudden, I really want some French fries. Mm. And there is a be- they do have some kind of bed and breakfast up there on the site too. And I think it's the place where the ghost hunters stay when they come to the- when they come to film and stuff. Okay. So that's something to keep in mind if you want to stay close, but not in the building. <laughs> There's that. Yeah, I, I don't know that I would want to, you know, roll out my sleeping bag right there on the bowling alley. Yeah, I wouldn't want to do that either. It, it, it is a very dusty, gritty location. There's paint peeling everywhere. I mean, they're doing their best with what they have to stabilize. And I think they are doing a fairly good job of it, but... Whew, it's it's definitely, you, you can tell, it needs a lot of love. Yeah, it just looked like that from the pictures. But the cool thing is, you know, if they continue to do the haunted house and do these tours, it will help. I mean, it takes a long time to renovate Absolutely. these places. Yeah. The fact that it's such a small group of people there that really seem to care about the history of the building and really trying to use it to tell a story of... Radford's community. I think that's such a beautiful thing. So I definitely want to help out as much as I can with that. Whitney, thank you so much for suggesting this. And I love it when people, as you know, have been to a location and not only have you been there to do a tour, but you've actually investigated it and experienced stuff, which makes it amazing. It it was amazing. That place, no matter what, it's going to sink its fingers into you and it's you're never going to forget it. Well, again, thank you for joining me and you and your family stay healthy as we go through this COVID crisis. Yes, you too. You and Kelly take good care of each other. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So Kelly, it was pretty interesting hearing some of the experiences that Whitney has had. It makes me want to go there. Definitely. Absolutely. (laughs) We need to do an investigation. Sounds like a great place. And what I really enjoyed about her experiences is nothing in anything that she said there seemed overly scary. I mean, she was being poked in the back, which how do you get poked in the back when you have your back up basically against a wall and you have a backpack on? I was going to say she had a backpack on, right? Yeah. (laughs) So that one is like, wow, how did that happen? But again, ghosts can go through things. So was it able to poke through all of that and then stop right where her back was? I don't know. I guess. I don't know. And then I love the nanu nanu wiggling of her ears down in the (laughs) bowling alley. (laughs) But what makes this interesting is she mentioned that she had done this with a couple of celebrity ghost hunters. I'm sure there's other listeners out there that have done these things where you have a couple of celebrity ghost hunters going around with the equipment and helping you do your investigating and stuff. Well, we decided to watch the Tennessee Wraith Chasers, the one that they did on their show when they were doing the Ghost Asylum TV series that they were hosting. And one of the places they went to was the St. Albans Sanatorium. And what did you think about that versus what we hear from Whitney? (laughs) Well, I, I thought they did a good job. But again, and I don't know if this is, you know, just a TV thing. But there were a lot of over the top about aggressiveness Mm -hmm. in terms of what they were experiencing because it didn't seem like anything was really all that aggressive because their reactions were more like, oh, hey, what was that? But then they're like, oh, it aggressively touched me. Mm -hmm. So it kind of I don't know. (laughs) I'm just always skeptical when it comes to over the top reactions. Yeah, I mean, this group of guys, I don't mind watching them. It's not like watching yeah, it was entertaining Zach Bagans yeah, running no, around. I, think, I, I agree with that. I think that they were they were respectful. I felt like they did a good job. Mm-hmm. It's just when you see those over the top reactions and talking about how it was so aggressive and everything, I, I wasn't seeing that in their, their words weren't matching their body reactions during the filming. Let's exactly. Put it that way. Because here, here's what is interesting. You have Whitney describing almost exactly the same experience. So definitely right. something in the bowling alley likes to play with people's ears. I don't know what the fascination is there. <laughs> but they automatically equated it to this red-eyed, black, shadowy figure that's supposedly down there. And like you said, I think Chris, who is the founder of the Tennessee Wraith Chasers, he didn't even move his head at all. He's just like, something is is touching my ear. And then all of a sudden he throws in aggressively. Well, if something's touching you aggressively, I would think you'd yank your head away. You'd move away quickly. You're going to move a lot more reactively 
Whitney is describing it as like the TV show Mork and Mindy, Nanu Nanu, playing with her ears. And then you have Chris saying something's aggressively touching his ear. It's right. totally different experiences. And it's like, okay, one is on TV. The other one isn't. I'm going to lean more towards Whitney's experience being what really was going on. Because again, like you said, the body language wasn't saying something is aggressively touching right. me. Right, exactly. Especially an aggressive touch on the ear is not touching it. It's yanking it, I would think. Yeah, I would imagine. Or flicking it really hard. Yeah. Something of that nature. I don't I don't think that the reaction matched at all <laughs> for what was said. And then on the show, they go in with a Faraday cage thinking that they're going to trap a spirit inside of it, which to me is just utter, complete nonsense. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know enough about it, but it certainly seems like it's pulled from like Ghostbusters movie or something like that. And they treated it kind of that way. Yeah. Like they were going to take it back and, and find Slimer in it or something. <laughs> but here's the thing. I'm not real familiar with Faraday cages either, but based on my novice knowledge, I always thought a Faraday cage was for you to protect yourself inside of from some kind of electrical impulses or something ah. like that. I didn't think it was something that you used to trap something inside like that. And then also on the ghost asylum, they basically kind of went with the whole idea that there had been that massacre on this land that Whitney and I debunked. Right. Everywhere I was looking, it was talking about this massacre and it has a name for it. So I'm like, okay, well, let me look it up and see where it's at because I want to verify stuff. And I'm like, this is like the difference of where we live in Orlando and something happens in Orlando and trying to say it's haunting something here. Yeah, quite a bit of distance. There might have been some kind of skirmish on this land, but we don't know about it. And I don't know that it's lending anything particular to this. And you don't really need to have anything added to it because you've got a boys school, which you can imagine a boys school back in the day where you didn't have rules against hazing and bullying, the kind of stuff that would have gone on there. Sure. And the pressure to be able to be at a higher standard leads some children, unfortunately, to commit suicide because they just can't meet those standards. So we don't know what happened necessarily with the school. And then, of course, sanatoriums and asylums, we all know those are full of spirits. So you don't really necessarily need to have had this there before. There is a lot of paranormal activity reported here. And Whitney Zahar joined us to share her experiences investigating St. Albans. So is St. Albans Sanatorium haunted? That, that is for you, you to, to decide. decide. Well, we'll definitely have to make sure we head on up to Virginia and make a trip there. There's lots of things to do in Virginia. We're going to have to do a, a statewide yeah, kind of thing. It's going to need to be a long trip. Yeah. <laughs> lots to be seen and experienced and investigated. We want you guys to check out our website, historygoesbump.com. And if you want to send us some feedback, you can do that at historygoesbump at gmail.com. I want to thank Patrick for his email. It was very sweet and greatly appreciated. Also, Kelly, you and I did something really fun this last Friday, May 1st, May Day, Beltane, half a ween. It's a pretty big day. <laughs> we had a listener, Kristen Swintek, who had asked some people if they wanted to do a virtual happy hour with her. So we joined her the Friday before this. And she was like, wouldn't it be cool to be able to do this with some of the spooky crew? And I'm like, yeah, let's set something up. And trying to use Facebook Messenger to do a video kind of conferencing thing with a group. I couldn't figure out really yeah. how that would work. So we went over to Zoom and did a Zoom HGB virtual happy hour on May 1st. And on the free plan that they give you, it's like you can have <laughs> up to 100 people in 40 minutes. So I'm like, okay, well, we'll do 40 minutes. Well, we got about 30 minutes into it. and It popped up with this little message that we could continue for as long as we wanted. No limit. So we ended up doing two hours. It was a lot of fun. For that happy hour. It was <laughs> so much fun. We want to thank everybody who joined us for it. It was so neat to see some of you again, because a lot of you we've met in person. Person. Right. And we, then we got to see some faces that we haven't seen before. Definitely. And it, we, we talked about anything and everything. <laughs> Nothing was off limits, no. I think. <laughs> so we got to know each other very well. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. So we decided that we're going to do it again, especially since everybody's still, you know, having to be cooped up and everything. So this Friday, May 8th, 2020, at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, we will be hosting another Zoom virtual happy hour. And if you want to get the link for that, you need to be a member of the Spooktacular crew, and it will be posted at the top in the announcements. And you just click on that. Make sure you have a Zoom account so you can come and join us and bring your favorite beverage. And we'll sit around and talk spooky stuff and personal stuff and all kinds of good stuff. So one of our listeners, Chelsea, suggested that we tell spooky stories. So maybe we'll do a little bit of that. 
yeah, I mean, I've got plenty of books. I could pull something out of there and I'll have something to share. If you guys have a little short, scary, spooky story or even a personal experience, those are... Personal experiences are fun. I actually shared something <laughs> that was kind of weird that happened <laughs> with did. Riley. So I won't get into the specifics, but people who were at the Zoom meeting will remember what I talked about. <laughs> the topic was bathroom. So that kind of... Yeah. <laughs> there was a haunting a in our moment. bathroom. <laughs> Oh, my. We want to thank you guys for tuning into this episode. I've been your host, Diane. And this has been Kelly. You take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This episode has been brought to you by Kobo Audiobooks and our executive producers. Dispatches from the Grave Digger. We want to thank Zena Zarfin for her donation. Also want to thank Darren for increasing his level. We're going to be moving you into a chest tomb. Cheryl McReynolds increased hers. As well, we'll be moving her into a garden tomb. And happy birthday to you, Cheryl. Yes, happy birthday. And we want to welcome into the cemetery, Greg Bowman. Mort will be putting you into a garden tomb. Thank you so much for supporting the show, you guys. Check out the website at historygoesbump.com. As it cruised at 65,000. <laughs> There's that extra zero. <laughs> it's always either an extra zero or taking one off, Kelly. I don't know why <laughs> my brain processes it that way. It just comes out of my mouth. <laughs> you have a number something. There's, there's got to be some kind of disease or disorder that does... Mixing up of numbers. I'm numbers challenged. <laughs> Number dyslexic? I don't know. No. As it cruised at 60... I still want to say 65,000. Well, because 6,500 seems like a really low cruise. Right. Altitude, but that's what they cruised at back don't back. give excuses for me. I just can't read numbers. <laughs> the purser felt that... Oh, the pussy? The pussy. The face of the stamp featured a profile of Queen... The cream, cream, cream. <laughs> don't, don't be disrespectful. <laughs> no wonder I couldn't read earlier. My glasses were on top of my head. Oh. <laughs> Minor detail. Just a little. I did that once. You reused a stamp? <laughs> I did. Well, okay. <laughs> oh, you're so, going to jail. <laughs> there's Mm-mm-mm. a story behind it. The stamp had a photo of my boys when they were little. Okay. So it was like a personalized stamp. And for whatever reason, it got sent to my mom and she just peeled it off. And well, I guess I should say she reused it, but it was my stamp. So now my mom's in trouble. So you're just an accomplice. (laughs) I'm just an accomplice. After the, after the fact. After the fact. (laughs) As was the case with so many hospitals for the mentally ill. (laughs) Mentally? The menthol. Did they treat them with menthol? <laughs> menthol fixes everything. Rub it on your feet. Uh, rub when it on your chin. I'm telling you, I love it. <laughs> I always have my mentholatum around. <laughs> There's so many different things that that supposedly works for. As was the case with... God, why can I not talk? As was as was the case with... So, <laughs> what God, is, what is wrong problem? with your tongue? <laughs> oh Need more coffee? <laughs>